Good afternoon, and welcome to this uh, semi-plenary session, where we will have the pleasure to listen to Professor Hugh Garnier from the University of Lorraine. Hugh got his PhD from the University of Nancy 20 years ago, and I understand that the University of Nancy is now subsumed in, in, of the University of Lorraine, which means that he has moved geographically very much in 20 years. But he has spent a lot of uh, uh, visiting positions all, all over the world or under, under that period also. I, I, and I think the control community, primarily know Hig as a, an ambassador and promoter of continuous time system identification. He has written many fundamental contributions in the area. And he has also spent a lot of time to promote other activities. He has co-authored and co-edited co several books on the, on the topic and being, co being the uh, guest editor of several special issues on C continuous time system identification. He, he's also behind the MATLAB continuous time identification toolbox called, called CONCID, CONCID. And he'll continue his promotional activities right now to and speak about exactly that, continuous, direct continuous time system identification. Please, do, we look forward to that. Please. Thank you, Thank you uh, very much, uh, Lenard, for this kind of uh, introduction. Good afternoon, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here today. As Lenart uh, mentioned it, I have two objectives today. The first is to present an overview of uh, the direct continuous time approaches to system identification. And the second objective is to discuss and illustrate the benefits of these identification methods in practical applications. Uh -huh. All right, so you will have to identify what is written. <laughs> this is a good start. All right, uh, so system identification, as many people here know, is an established field in the area of system analysis and control. It aims at building mathematical models that describe the input-output behavior of a, of a system based on observed data. Uh-huh. You're lucky this time. Models are needed in many situations to understand, to simulate, or to control systems. Models are also used in different areas, from mechanical to biomedical engineering, and in many industrial applications. So we can say that system identification is a, is a, a major field, but recent developments have introduced new opportunities as we will see. Okay, we can distinguish usually two types of parameterized models. The first is known as gray box models. Their parameters have a direct physical interpretation. The model structure is usually constructed in continuous time from physical principles, but there are two main shortcomings with this gray box model. The first is that they cannot be built in the case of complex systems where the physical principles are not very well established or too involved. And the second is related to the fact that some parameters might not be identifiable from the data. The second type of mathematical models is known as black box models. In this situation, the parameters have no physical interpretation, no direct physical interpretation, and these models are families of very flexible models which can be applied in a very wide uh, application. In this talk, I will concentrate on black box model identification only. If we look back to the historical developments for system identification, it appears that early research focused on identification of continuous time models from continuous time data at that time. From the uh, early 70s, coming with the developments in digital data acquisition and computers, computer uh, discrete time model identification from sample data took over the field. And Lenart toolbox uh, the MATLAB system identification toolbox has greatly helped to disseminate these discrete time identification methods. It appears that many practitioners are unaware that continuous time model identification from sample data 
not only exist, but they can be better suited to, to solve their uh, identification problem. And actually, if you look to the last decade, it has witnessed a growing interest in these direct continuous time efforts to system identification. Okay, let us review now the main approaches to identify a black box model from sample data. We have a continuous time system. We have to uh, handle and to deal with continuous time system mainly. We suppose that we can send an input to this uh, continuous time system through an hold, and we measured the output. And so basically, nowadays, you start from a data set, which are sample data, u of tk and y of tk here. And let's assume that we want to identify a continuous time black box model. The reasons are diverse, and I will uh, come back to the, to the reason later. So how can we do that? Some of you probably have some answers, and they are their favorite approaches. And they will say, OK, let's go through what is known the indirect approach. I am an expert in discrete time model identification. Why not first identify a discrete time model from the sample data? And you can use many routines available in the system identification toolbox. And then your discrete time model has to be converted. And as many of you know, know this conversion step can be dedicated some time. The other approach is called direct approach, which aim to directly identify the parameters of the continuous time model from the sample data. We are going to focus on this direct approach today. This approach is less known. It has been presented as quite involved, and we will see that actually it is quite straightforward. And it presents many advantages. So to illustrate these advantages, let us consider a simulation example with the aim to compare the performance of both continuous time direct and discrete time indirect approaches. So the system is a simulated system of order four. It has been uh, known uh, for some times as the Rao Garnier benchmark. The transfer function given here in continuous time, P is a differentiation operator here, uh, so it's given here, and it has one unstable zero and two pseudo oscillatory modes. The, bod the body diagram plotted here makes appear the two pseudo oscillatory modes, which are here separated by one decade. And for the performance uh, evaluation coming later, this body plot uh, will be uh, used to uh, evaluate the performance of, of the uh, estimation methods. At first sight, when you look at the body plot at this first fourth order system, it doesn't seem too complicated to identify. So to get an average performance evaluation of the direct continuous time and indirect con discrete time efforts, we have used a Monte Carlo simulation. And so the simulation conditions are the following here, but we have also tested different kind of input, different kind of noise, different kind of, uh, of signal to noise ratio. I just present here something which can be considered as representative of the overall results you can get. So here, the, peer, the, the input is a, a pseudo-random binary signal, which is classically used in system identification. And it respects the zero order all assumption, which is normally uh, assumed in, in discrete time model identification. The sampling time is set to 10 milliseconds. The choice of a sampling time can be very tricky sometimes. Here. It can be considered as fast, but not irrealistic in view of the resonance frequency of 20 radian per second. And actually, the, frequency, the sampling frequency is about 10 times the system bandwidth, which is an often given rule. The, the, the noise that is added to the noise-free output 
In this case, take the form of a discrete time white noise, and the signal to noise ratio is just 10 dB. All right, for you to get a feeling of the noise level, here is an example for one realization of the noise. Uh, in the Monte Carlo simulation, we used 100 runs, so we just have here uh, the input and output data for one realization of this noise. And we are going to use this uh, input and output data set to fit a discrete time and a continuous time model. So the signal to noise ratio is equal to 10 dB. The noise level is not very high. And once again, from this plot, we don't see why it should be difficult to fit a good model from the data. OK, let us describe the discrete time and, con and continuous time model structure to be identified and the related estimation methods used. So if you assume the correct zero order old, the discrete time model will have eight parameters to be estimated. Four parameters in the numerator have to be estimated in this zero order old condition, even if the original continuous time system has only two parameters in the numerator. And the additional artificial zeros are well known and are due to the zero order old discretization. So we have used three traditional uh, discrete time methods included in the system identification toolbox. Uh, the first method used is known as the IV4, which is a multi-step IV, which differs from the iterative IV described later. The second is the subspace methods, abbreviated by n 4 seed and the last is the output error method. In the case of the continuous time models, the a priori knowledge about the number of parameters to be estimated for the numerator is very easy to accommodate. So the continuous time model has only six parameters to be estimated, and we have used three direct continuous time methods included in the CONCEIT toolbox that I will present later, but also in the system identification toolbox uh, to identify this continuous time. So the first method is a very basic LSSVF method, which will be reviewed later. And the second is the SRIVC method, which is an iterative IV. And the last is the TF, the recent TF method, which is a prediction error method uh, implemented in the system identification toolbox. It is important to, to stress that all routines from the system identification toolbox and the CONCEIT toolbox have been used in their default mode uh, with the latest version of MATLAB. So we don't specify any special input arguments. We just use the, the methods in their default mode. All right, let us first look at the result obtained by the discrete time methods. So as I said, we, to get to evaluate the, the performance of the methods, we, uh, we could have displayed the, the value of the parameters. This is not very easy to compare uh, numbers. So we use instead to, to plot the body plot of the 100 estimated models and compare it with a true body plot. You will get a better feeling of the performance of the, of the approach. So let us start by, by the IV4. This is the result that you, can, you will get. So you can clearly see that uh, the, the methods doesn't perform very well. Let us see if the n 4 seed methods perform better. Well, from this plot, it appears that it is not the case. The variance of the response seems even larger. OK. The last will probably do better. This is the output error methods which has the appropriate model structure, assume. Here are, are the results. It does a little bit better, but there are clearly many cases where the prediction error methods based routine has converged to a local minimum. These results are not too good, but let us see now how the continuous time methods perform on the same data set. All right, let us start by looking at the result obtained by the simple least square SVF method. The identified models obtained by LSSVF are much closer on average to the true response than the discrete time models. What about the two 
other continuous time efforts, starting by SRIVC. Here are the results you can get. Okay, the SRIVC, the 100 SRIVC models are very close, close to the true body response. Actually, they are plotted in red, but these red plots can hardly be distinguished from the true frequency response plotted in blue, except if you can see in the low frequency part where a little bit of red can be observed. The same good results are obtained by using the TFS methods, recently uh, included in the system identification toolbox. Note, however, that this routine in its default mode is initiated by SRIVC, which would explain why the results for SRIVC and TFS are so similar here. Okay, what can be concluded from these benchmark results? Even if a, a general conclusion cannot be drawn from one simulation example, the results for discrete time efforts are quite representative of the problems you can meet uh, with this routine if you, are, if you use them in their default mode. It turns out that both PEM and IV4 are initiated from, in this case, highly biased ARX model estimates. They also suffer from numerical issues in this fast sampling situation. These results were confirmed by Lennart Leung in a previous ECC conference. People who are experts in system identification would know how to solve the problem, how to make these discrete time efforts work better. You probably all know that. Maybe you have some idea. If not, the key is to move the focus of the model fit to lower frequency. So if you are, if you are experienced, you should have used one of the two solutions. Don't use the raw data. Apply some kind of data pre-filtering or apply some data decimation. That will greatly improve the results obtained. However, there is one remaining difficulty. How to choose a priori the pre-filter? The same for the decimation rate. How is it a decimation rate by two, by five? This is not so easy to do. Especially when you compare the results obtained by direct continuous time efforts, and we will see that they include inherent data pre-filtering. You don't have to bother about the choice of a, of a pre-filter. And so they are, these techniques are free of these difficulties, and it seems worth to know more about the theory behind these approaches. Okay, after this introductory uh, uh, example, the outline of my talk uh, will be the following. I will briefly review the main approaches for continuous time model identification. I will concentrate on one particularly reliable instrumental variable method, the IV methods, abbreviated by SRIVC. And I will present some extension to more advanced situations. Then in the second part, I will describe the software tools available and present a quick guided tour of the concept toolbox. And finally, in the third part, I will discuss the advantages of these direct continuous time methods and present two examples that demonstrate the practical utility of these methods. Okay, let us start by the first section. And before looking at the theory behind this approach, I need first to state the objective we should have when developing estimators. So the first focus is to construct estimator to be unbiased. We want to have unbiased parameter estimate. Okay. The second focus is to construct estimator with minimum variance. And in any case, as small as possible. Of course, it would be even great if we can get both unbiased and minimum variance. This is what is called and known optimal estimate in that case. 
There are further aspects as well to look at. We need to strive to get a robust estimator. As potential users of system identification techniques, you will be very interested by this part. We need to get or to, to design uh, estimator to be robust to assumptions used to derive the different methods, but also to be robust to experiment design. We saw an example before. How to choose this, what is the impact of the choice of the sampling period when you have the choice to set the sampling period? What is the impact of the measurement setup? Do you have to use uh, a certain input? Do you have to use an uh, anti-aliasing filter? Is it important? And the last one is to design estimator to be robust to algorithmic aspect. Does the, the, the methods include pre-filtering? What is the impact of the initialization? All of these aspects are very important. OK. So let us see how we can really identify the parameters of a continuous time model directly from sample data. And first, there is a basic issue behind continuous time model identification. Because if you look at what happened in, in the case of discrete time model, in this case, uh, the model takes the form of a different equation model where only input and output sample appear. Nothing else. Very easy. You just need to measure the input and the output. You've got the sample data. You can build up your different equation model. It's very easy. That's right. In the case of the continuous time uh, model, uh, the model takes the form of a differential equation, which contains not only the input and output, but also the time derivatives of the input and of the output. And usually, as you know, these variables, except in certain cases when you can measure the velocity and the acceleration, but most of the time, you do not measure this uh, time derivative. And that was presented as a crucial issue for a long time, and this is why, for some people, these kind of techniques are more complicated. But you will see, actually, that there is a very easy way to handle this issue. A well-known approach is to handle this time derivative problem is to apply a data pre-filtering strategy. It will give you some smooth time derivative estimates. Let us see how it works. OK, so this is the idea behind one of the older methods that was uh, designed, which is known as the traditional state variable filter or SVF methods. So we start from the differential equation model, and we apply a stable filter, L of P, on both sides. The pre-filter differential equation model obeys exactly this filtered equation where the subscript f will be used from now on to, to, to denote the filtered variables. OK. Then the question is, how to compute the filtered variable? Well, it's easy. You just take the input signal, the output signal, build up a bank of SVF filter, and you send both input and output to two banks of filters and you get the filtered time derivatives. You just need to use an appropriate ODE solver to compute this at the different time instant. Very easy, OK? But then there is still one remaining problem. What kind of filter do we, can we use? Well, at that time, the idea was to, to use something very simple. So the, in the case of the SVF filters, the filter takes this form. It's only 1 over p plus lambda power n, n being the order of the differential equation. And so for the user, it only has to, to, to specify one uh, parameter for this filter, which is lambda, and lambda is just the cutoff frequency of the filter. The filtering time derivative can then be used to estimate the parameters 
of the different differential equation model. So at time tk, the, the, the filtered differential equation model can be rewritten in a linear regression form, where here you see the regression vector phi f, which is given here, includes the different filtered time derivatives. And from this regression model, you can use, of course, for different sample observed at different time instant. And this time instant do not need to be uh, equally, uh, ir um, equidistantly uh, spaced, can be irregularly spaced. We will come back to that later. But the LS-based SVF parameter estimates are then computed from the solution, which is well known of the, of the, of the least square here. OK, so this simple least square-based SVF estimator can be summarized uh, in, the following way, in, the, in the following way. We first send both input and output signal to two bank of filters and uh, to generate the filter time derivative, then the, the parameters are estimated by, by simple least square. And this uh, simple least square represents what is known as the simplest archetype of continuous time model identification from sample data. I give here just a recap of the result obtained by using the simple LSSVF methods on the benchmark. The results are not too bad in comparison with the discrete time uh, methods, but a small bias can be observed around the higher mode and in the low frequencies. Okay, so to conclude, what can we say? LSSVF is very simple. It has some uh, very nice properties. It's, uh, the analytical solution is easy to compute. It has low computational complexity, but it has two shortcomings. The first, as we saw on the, on the body plot, the estimates will be always biased. And this comes from the fact that the regression vector will always be correlated with the uh, uh, filtering noise. The second shortcoming is that it can be quite sensitive to the SVF uh, cutoff frequency. And we don't like to be sensitive. As I said, we want to be robust against uh, this uh, user parameter choice. So this is a motivation for, for investigating more advanced methods. We can do better than that. OK, there are two traditional solutions to the least square bias problem. The first is the well-known prediction error method. The second is apparently less known and is the instrumental variable method. To get rid of the bias issue, the main idea be be behind the prediction error methods is to model the noise. It is a general approach applicable to a wide range of model structure. The condition to obtain optimal prediction error methods have been long established. If the assumption about the noise are valid, then you will get optimal estimates. All of these are very nice properties. This explains why it has been used so largely. However, it involves often solving a non-convex optimization problem. And so it relies on iterative nonlinear optimization. First of all, the comp they are computationally quite demanding. And, of course, you need to, to, uh, to pay some special attention for initialization of this iterative search. This is one of the key here if you want to succeed. Otherwise, you will be trapped in false solutions that correspond to local minima. Everything is well known here, but you, you have to know that. The main idea behind the IV methods is also to model the noise. It's also a general approach applicable to a wide range of model structure. You can use it to identify output error, box and Jenkins, or, what, or, or other model structures. The condition to obtain optimal IV estimates are also uh, well established. And here you will have to specify two things. The first is instrumental variable. You need to specify what is known as the instrument. 
denoted here by ZF. And you will have also to specify a pre-filter L of P here. If the assumption about the noise are valid, same as the PEM, you will get optimal estimates. If the assumption about the noise are not valid, but you still have the, the, the right order for the transfer function, for the plant transfer function, you will get unbiased estimate, but not minimum variance estimates. This is a nice property. As we'll see, they are based on linear or pseudo-linear regress linear, uh, regression, and so they do not rely on non-linear optimization, and so they have a low computational complexity, which is comparable to the least square, and surprisingly, IV methods appear to be underappreciated. This is my, my personal opinion, of course. Uh, the two main references for IV methods appeared almost at the same time in the early 80s. The first is a book by uh, Torsten Soderstrom and Peter Storica, and the second is a book by my friend Peter Young from Lancaster University, and a second edition of this book was uh, recently published in 2011. So it is also interesting to note that uh, the authors are still very active in the domain, and they have published very recently nice pieces of work whose references are given here. OK, let us review, and this is maybe the most uh, difficult part for you to follow, but this is where I'm going to give you uh, the key to, uh, to understand the, the optimal IV. So let us review the general results to get optimal IV estimates. We assume a data generating system, given here, where G0 denotes the plant model, while H0 denotes the noise model. Nothing new here. OK, the results are valid for both discrete or continuous time models. And this is why I used rho here instead of p, because rho can denote either the differential equation p, differential operator p, or the shift operator uh, q. So the model can be also written uh, in the linear regression for, form, where phi is the regression vector, as before. So what are the conditions on the instrument and prefuture to get optimal estimate? Well, to get optimal estimates, it turns out that the filter has to be chosen as the inverse of the noise model, H0, times the denominator of the plant model, <coughs> while the instrument, ZF, should be chosen as the noise-free version of the regression vector filtered by the optimal filter. OK, the noise-free version of phi is denoted by phi naught, OK? So because phi usually include uh, the, the output, it, it has noise in it. And phi naught is uh, the noise-free version of this guy. So we can see here that in inherent filtering is a distinguish, in, distinguishing feature of optimal IV. This is quite interesting for continuous time model identification because if you remember, we need to use a filter to generate the, 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 the time derivatives. So the filtering will, on the top of that, ensures minimum variance estimate, and as I said, it will provide a very convenient way for generating the time derivatives. And we will see that uh, in contrast to the LSSVF, we can, by using these IV methods, uh, choose in an automatic and optimally way this pre-filter. All right, to implement the optimal IV solution, we are faced with the usual dilemma met with accuracy optimization, which requires the knowledge of the true plant and the noise models. Some of you can maybe think, well, e show us some, some results where, to get the optimal estimates, he has to know the, the system beforehand. This is not possible. Well, it has also to, we have also to, 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 to get uh, the noise-free version of the regression vector, which 
itself requires the knowledge of the noise-free output at x. So two different implementations have been suggested. The first is a multi-step procedure. You can forget about it, but I need to, to, to stress that this is possible. One example of this multi-step procedure has been implanted, implemented in the IV4. Four means four stages, and this is a routine which is available in the system identification toolbox. And from my experience and from the results I presented in the case of the uh, Haogani benchmark, it can be quite unreliable in practice. It's much better to use an iterative procedure. One example of this iterative procedure has been implemented in the SRIVC routine, available in the CONCI toolbox. It assumes a continuous time output error model structure, and it is particularly reliable in practice, as we saw from the uh, benchmark. OK, so let us see the machinery behind SRIVC in detail. So SRIVC stands for simple, refined IV for continuous time models. So the data generating system takes the form of a continuous time output error model, meaning that actually the noise is assumed to be white, and so the noise model H0 equals 1. The optimal choice for the instrument and the filter are so uh, simplified in the sense that the filter takes only the form of 1 over A0. But still, the, the optimal solution requires the knowledge of the true plant model and the noise-free output. The solution, which was suggested some time ago, is to use an iterative procedure where the instrument and the prefilter uh, will be iteratively adapted until they converge on their, on their optimal value. Here I recall the uh, uh, traditional, uh, uh, the classical uh, solution to compute the IV estimates, where you see uh, the instrument ZF uh, that appears. Okay. So the SRIVC methods can be summarized in the following way. So usually, uh, free, so you start sorry, from uh, the input and output uh, sample data. You can use any algorithm, for example, the basic LSSVF methods to get an initial estimate. You use this initial estimate to build uh, an auxiliary model that will make you able to uh, compute an initial value of of the uh, noise-free output, x at, then you send all the input, output, and noise-free estimates to a bank of filters, and you can use the initial parameter estimates to set the initial value of 1 over a, and then you compute a first uh, estimate, or a second estimate, by, uh, by the traditional IV solution. And you don't stop here. It's an iterative procedure, so you update. You update both the auxiliary model and also the, uh, the bank of filters. And usually, only three to five iterations are sufficient for the algorithm to converge. OK, a recap of the very good results obtained in the case of the Rao Garnier benchmark is given here. And as we saw, the responses of the 100 estimated SRIVC models can hardly be distinguished from the body plot of the true system. So the SRIVC algorithm uh, provides a, a quick and quite reliable approach to continuous time model identification, and this is the approach that I will recommend you to use uh, for day-to-day -day use. Okay, let us see uh, some extensions now. So SRIVC has been extended to handle a uh, wider practical application. I focus so far to linear model identification, but we can also handle more uh, complex situation. Uh, and some of this extension will now be briefly uh, introduced. So continuous time model identification can be also done in the frequency domain, of course. And uh, a similar iterative IV mechanism can be performed in the frequency domain. The problem 
can be formulated starting from a measured frequency response, if you, you have it, or if you have an estimate value of it, or the problem can be uh, formulated starting from a measured, uh, uh, oh sorry, starting from a continuous time frequency domain data, for example, if your input is band limited. And so the, the SRIVC uh, methods has been uh, naturally uh, extended to be applicable in the frequency domain. Now we know that both time domain, frequency domain, they are, there, they are very similar. And it's very useful as well to, to be able to, uh, to do it in the frequency domain. Okay, uh, identification for control in industrial practice is often reduced to the determination of simple process models of low orders. You just need to identify a first order plus delay or second order plus delay, like this example even here. And many methods have been developed to handle that. And of course, we can also naturally adapt the SRIVC to identify this kind of, uh, of simple process model. Very useful from step response, given or similar type of response. Another problem uh, from the practical uh, point of view. If you followed, if you have followed so far, the assumption in SRIVC is the noise is white. Some of you may think, well, this is not very nice. Well, it is nice because, okay, uh, you can tell me this is an assumption which is strong. Uh, I might agree with that depending on the, on the noise. But if really we, the, the noise uh, is important, then we have the solution. Because in practice, and I would agree with that, uh, 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 this situation is, is rare and we will have to handle color noise. And so, even uh, in this situation with color noise, SRIVC, because it's using the IV, will provide you unbiased estimates. The variance will be low, but will not be minimum anymore. Why is that? Because the pre-filters are not designed in SRIVC to, to account for the color of the noise. So we, we uh, look at that recently, and we have developed the full simple as disappear. So we have developed RIVC, which is an optimal IV approach for continuous time hybrid, hybrid box and Jenkins model. Why, what is the meaning of hybrid here? It's hybrid in the sense that the plant will be modeled in continuous time, and the noise will be modeled in discrete time. Okay, uh, also another problem in, uh, in industrial practice that you can meet is that many times, uh, many systems have feedback and you cannot ask the guy to stop uh, the, the process to, to do an identification experiment. In that case, to get good results, IV have to be adapted because not only the output has noise, but also also now the input is contaminated by noise. So you have to, you have to modify the, uh, the pre-filters, and this has been done recently as well with the help of some colleagues, and nowadays uh, it is uh, available. Further extension, uh, still related to a practical situation. In practice, the nature of the system is most of the time time varying. And if you try to fit a, a time invariant model, well, your model will probably be uh, unable to capture the change in system characteristics. So the first solution that we uh, developed is to use LT, still LTI model, but with time varying parameters. And so we have developed a recursive version of SRIVC to track the varying parameters. Here you have an example of a second order system where the three parameters varies. The first like a sign, the second, is constant at the bottom, and the last one uh, varies, uh, has a step-like form. So you see that we can follow very well the varying parameters. The second option to solve this uh, time-varying system uh, feature, in some cases, if you have a, a good uh, knowledge about the, the why and, and, and the dependency of some variable of the, of the varying parameters, 
you can use an LPV model to parameterize the time varying nature of the parameters. So, but this would require that you measure what is called the scheduling variable. And again, we have uh, adapted and uh, implemented uh, SRIVC and RIVC methods for LPV input-output models. All right, it's time now to move on on the second part of my talk, which present uh, the different software tools available. It is very important to have tools, and software play uh, a major role uh, for system identification. Several actively maintained toolboxes are available. You are probably users of the system identification toolbox, which was developed by Lenart a long time ago. But there is also the frequency domain identification toolbox. If you are from Newcastle, uh, you might know the University of Newcastle identification toolbox developed by Brett Muniz. And there is also the Captain Toolbox, developed by uh, Peter Young. So in these toolboxes, you might find a few routines which will allow you to directly identify a continuous time model from sample data. But there, were, there was no software entirely dedicated to direct continuous time approaches, and that was the main motivation to, uh, to develop the CONCID which was first released uh, more than 15 years ago. Okay, so what are the key features of this CONCID toolbox? CONCID stands for Continuous Time System Identification. Makes sense. And it supports most of the time, and you saw also the frequency domain methods, for identifying continuous time parametric models of both linear and nonlinear systems from both regularly and irregularly sample data. So it provides transfer function model identification for CISO, single input, single output, and also MIMO systems. The algorithms are mainly based on the iterative SRIVC algorithm, but you, there are a few uh, prediction error methods and subspace based methods. The interesting feature is that actually the CONCEIT toolbox can be seen as an add-on to the MATLAB system identification toolbox. When you build up a toolbox, you have to decide about the format of the, of the, of the model given, about the format, the form of the, uh, of the uh, data set, uh, of the data object, etc. We have decided to make your life easy. If you are familiar with the system identification toolbox, it will be very easy for you to use the CONCEIT routine. They are using they are based on the same syntax, same data object, same model object. The good news is that the upcoming version, 7.0, uh, is fully compatible with the latest release of MATLAB. You will have to wait on, until end of August to get it. The other good news is that it's free. You can use it for free. You can just go to this website and download the software. Of course, if we want you to use it, we have to help you to understand how it works. So we have uh, include, included a, a flexible graphical interface, and we have written many demos to illustrate its use and the recent developments. So the main demonstration program for the CONCEIT toolbox is IDC demo. ID demo is for LENAR toolbox. So the demos are crucial for a software because as Lennart would say, uh, many users learn about the theory of system identification from the demos and toolbox manual guides. And this is certainly true. <clears throat> so if you run the main demonstration program, you will be invited to, to select from a, a menu window as shown here. And from the main window, the user can select between several demos. He can first see how perform the methods on some real-life data, coming from a flexible robot arm, a winding process. He can also look at some tutorials to become familiar with the use of the toolbox to identify linear models from time domain or frequency domain data, but also from frequency or step response data. The advantage of 
of the continuous time efforts are also illustrated by several demos, and I will come back to this advantage in a few minutes. And more advanced identification <coughs> are also demonstrated uh, by uh, this last menu. Okay, let us see now what are the benefits, the advantages you can expect if you use these continuous time approaches in practical applications. The first advantages to be mentioned are actually related to the use of continuous time models. We, are all, we have all a background of engineering. And continuous time models have certain advantages in comparison with their equivalent discrete time models. Continuous time models are more intuitive to control engineers in their day-to-day -day use. Many practical control designs are still uh, based on continuous time models. Continuous time models are often preferred for fault detection because they reveal a default more directly than the discrete time uh, equivalent. And another advantage is that the parameters are independent of the sampling time. <coughs> Other advantages to be mentioned <coughs> are coming from properties of direct continuous time efforts. Co continuous time efforts present indeed many advantages in relation to their equivalent discrete time efforts, and we saw some of them. The first is very important. They include inherent data pre-filtering. As seen before, this is data pre-filtering is often a key step to get success in the application of the system identification procedure. They are also well adapted to identify stiff systems, and we will illustrate this in a minute. They can cope easily with uh, Stiff systems, yep. And they can cope easily with irregularly sampled data. Let us consider the case of irregularly sampled data. This sampling scheme appears in many situations, from biomedical to environmental science. Irregularly sampled data can result from losses in data transmission, manual measurements, or even base sampling. A constant sampling interval is assumed for discrete time models. When the sampling period varies, the parameters of the discrete time model become also time varying. Of course, this estimation is still possible. The, the estimation of these uh, parameters is still possible, but it's much more uh, involved. In contrast, continuous time models represent the system at every time instant which does not need to be uh, equidistantly uh, spaced. The use of appropriate ODE solver for the digital implementation of the continuous time filtering operations is the only requirement. So as an example, let us consider a tracer experiment identification from irregularly sampled data. The data we use are coming from a real-life tracer experiment in a wetland located in Florida, and as some of you may know, tracer experiment is a traditional experiment used in environmental science to model transport and diff diffusion of pollutants in rivers or in wetlands. Here, the tracer material used is a conservative potassium bromide. And in this situation, irregularly sampled data arise because first the sampling is, rap is rapid to start with, so that the peak of the event is captured well, and the samples are then taken more slowly over the subsequent slow recession. The upstream and the downstream concentrations are shown here, where the irregularly uh, sampled data uh, is, is clear uh, from the sampling interval value over the time which is displayed at the bottom figure it can be uh, verified here that the sampling is very fast, two hours at the very beginning of the event, where you have a lot of, uh, 
of a circle and to become uh, slower 40 hours for the sampling period at the end of the event. So the best fit is obtained for a model order of two. The model parameters are estimated by applying the SRIVC algorithm directly to the irregularly sampled data. And we get this very good fit. And this kind of fit would be considered as, of course, excellent as well by people working in this, in this area. We move on now to the case of stiff system identification. This is very challenging from an identification procedure, uh, perspective. These stiff systems, they combine both slow and fast dynamics. This makes the selection of the sampling period very difficult. On one side, it requires rapid sampling to capture the fast dynamic. On the other side, it requires slow uh, sampling to identify the slow dynamics. Of course, these two requirements are incompatible, and usually, uh, the selection of a fast sampling uh, is done. So, but in this case of rapidly sampled data for stiff system, fitting an accurate model is quite complex because both algorithmic and numerical aspects play a role. Uh, in the case of discrete time methods, the pole of the estimated discrete time model will be very close to the unit uh, circle and possible numerical issue uh, may affect the estimated discrete time model parameters. In contrast, the continuous time methods are particularly well suited to fast sampling situation and they work well with rapidly sampled data from stiff system. A typical example of stiff response is a thermal transient response of semiconductor devices which combine both slow and fast thermal phenomena. Here we consider the case of a high-powered light-emitting diodes, LED, which are now currently used in modern uh, lighting systems. If you have an OD, you will probably have these kind of LEDs on your car. Transient LED responses uh, can be used to detect a possible thermal defect. We consider the case of a LED driven by a current step source and we measured the thermal stiff response. The goal, the goal is to fit a model, oh, sorry, is to fit a model from the data that capture the stiff behavior. The step response is plotted uh, here in both, at the top, a linear scale, and at the bottom, a logarithmic time scale. You can notice here that the data are sampled extremely fast with a sampling frequency of 50 kilohertz leading to a very large number of data, close to 100,000. The plot of lo in logarithmic scale at the bottom makes appear the separation between the fast and the slow thermal phenomena, showing the stiff behavior of the, of the response. And we are going to use this logarithmic, logarithmic scale to, uh, to compare the, the model response of different methods tested on, on this data. So the, the results are given here. We have tested four different methods to identify the model of order six from the stiff response. The first method is, of course, SRIVC. And we have also uh, used three prediction error methods, two in continuous time, one TFS in the system identification toolbox, one COE in the CONC toolbox. And of course, we also tested to identify a discrete time model by the OE routine. It can be noticed from, from this figure that SRIVC is the only method uh, that can reproduce the thermal effect of the lead with extremely high accuracy. While the PEM-based methods, both in continuous time here or in discrete time, all fail to capture, to capture the, the lead dynamics. Here, uh, the TFS routine is initiated, all the routines are initiated in the same way. Of course, uh, previously TFS was initiated from SRIVC, and to, be, to, to have a, a fair evaluation, we initiated all the iterative routine in the same way. Okay, so it's now time to, to conclude. So for more than 40 years, uh, the main general uh, stream 
for identification has been to identify discrete time models from sample data. To obtain good results, discrete time model identification requires the active participation uh, of an experienced practitioner to pre-process the data, apply data decimation or data pre-filtering. This accentuates the feeling that system identification is more an art than a science. We argue here that direct continuous time model identification has been underappreciated, although it includes many advantages, well adapted to irregularly and rapidly sampling situation, requires less participation from the user because it has inherent pre-filtering, and so it makes your life uh, as a potential user much easier. Among the different continuous time efforts, one is particularly recommended, the SRIVC, and we saw the different uh, advantages of this routine. Direct continuous time efforts are now available in many in different toolboxes, of course in the CONCID, and so it is hope that the use of these direct continuous time approaches will lead to a better appreciation of data-driven system identification in the general system and control community. The area of continuous time model identification is very active and the latest contribution can be found, can be, uh, found in three uh, recent publications, a book and two special issues uh, that appear in 2011 and 2014. And I cannot end this talk without expressing my special thanks to a few good friends who have influenced my research over many years. Thank you.